So I'm very excited about uh, having uh, Yuwa Nango here today. He is um, currently exhibiting in Bergen at the Festspielunstillingen or uh, Festspielunstillung or annual exhibition of uh, Bergen. Uh, very excited uh, to go and see it, which I'm going to do in a couple of weeks. Uh, I saw his work at Documenta and he was represented both in uh, Athens and in Kassel. Uh, I only got to see the Kassel exhibition, it was very exciting. It was two venues actually in Kassel, so we got to see both. And uh, it's, it's uh, Noe Nango lives in, uh, I'm just going to say something about him. He lives in Tromsø. He's an artist and an architect with a degree from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. Nango works with site-specific installations and self-made publication that explore the boundary between architecture, design, and with visual art. Uh, Nango, he says this about himself, or they say in Bergen, that uh, Nango and his people are reindeer herders from Sapmi. And as you probably all know, if not, you should know, that uh, uh, Sápmi is the traditional Sámi territory that covers northern Norway and parts of Sweden, Finland, and northwest Western Russia. Uh, the Sa Sápmi country uh, also have a lot of languages, which I'm sure that uh, you will tell us about, uh, which is very similar to what you were saying about Mexico. Um, uh, th th there is, if, when you go into the Bergen Kunsthall, uh, you will find three films that uh, Yuen Ango has made, uh, which is out there, and also an interview with him. Uh, all very interesting. Uh, in that interview, uh, it fascinated me to see when Nango talked, uh, talked about what it was like to go to an archi uh, uh, architectural education in Norway and be presented one half a page about uh, Sami architecture in this curriculum. <laughs> Uh, which took, I guess, a day or something to go through, maybe half a day, maybe not so long, even less, and what it was like. So uh, since his education, Yuwar has been uh, building a large uh, collection of books uh, which is relevant for Sami architecture. And that is utilized in the exhibition in Bergen in what is called, I, I, I didn't know, so... Uh, but it's very interesting, he's, he's going to tell us about that too, the Girjegumpi which is a small building uh, made as a nom nomadic library inspired by the Sami Gumpi. And also, uh, he has been using his van. For those of you who saw Documenta, uh, he actually used his van to go from Norway to Athens all the way through Europe. And as a, an example of the nomadic, uh, the nomadic people the, or that his background, the nomadic in his background. So a uh, very warm welcome to Yuan Nango. Thank you so much. Thank you to Kio for inviting me and Lotte. And thank you to Jorge for a great lecture, inspiring. Um, <clears throat> It's uh, interesting that you actually mentioned that uh, you referred to that sort of um, important moment uh, that I had as a student, because it's uh, it's kind of weird, but sometimes you know life can take a direction in a blink of an eye, and you maybe don't even notice that it has changed. But that very moment, those I guess thirty minutes uh, in architectural history class, when I felt this, I think I, you could call it some kind of anger towards um, the whole system for ignoring us as a people, as a culture, for ignoring the cultural architectural heritage that uh, I feel so strongly about and that I grew up with. Uh, it's uh, it's a quite uh, important and special thing uh, for me. <coughs> um, so yeah, in one way, uh, I think that I still is on the same path as I started that very day, in a way. Because I decided as a student, after that experience, I decided to start working with Sami architecture. I wanted to do, instead of 
I wanted to react towards my the feeling that I got. I wanted to, to explore the topic. I wanted to first learn what there was to learn. And then I wanted to create uh, a discussion about it. I wanted to create awareness about it. I wanted to point it out. Um, and I was... <clears throat> Uh, uh, during my studies doing this project, which is called the uh, Sami Hooks and Daida. It's already 13 years old, year, year old, and it's a, it's a project that, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a magazine. Uh, I, st I wanted to, instead of sort of maybe defining or like many architect students I think have done before me that has Sami heritage, I think they have designed buildings uh, with a sort of a Sami motif or a Sami purpose uh, and went very much into the sort of the 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 design task uh, while I was maybe more interested in the discourse around this very interesting topic. So I wanted to create a discussion platform, a place where um, uh, other people than me could uh, have an opinion about Sami architecture. I wanted to also challenge the idea of what Sami architecture could be. So making a magazine or a fan scene, you could call it, a DIY, a small little pamphlet, felt like the, um, the right place to start. So I was the editor and the photographer and the writer uh, <laughs> of this little magazine. Uh, it came out during my, as a part of my master thesis, along with a series of um, one-to-one -one installations and performances. Um, but um, uh, these magazines, uh, they still mean quite a lot to me. And I think in so many ways, I think I'm still doing a little bit the same that I did in this project, which is a very much of a research-based uh, experimental kind of project. Um, I stole a lot. So most of the material um, might look like I wrote, but I didn't. Uh, I took a lot of things from old historical books and sources, uh, things I found in, because there is quite, um, there's quite a few things that's published on Sami architecture, uh, but it's quite scattered. Mm, and I looked in ethnographic sources, and I looked also at you know the more contemporary buildings that has a Sami identity and found all the material that was written and uh, published on these buildings and I took it and I sort of dissected it and I cut and pasted it back into this this uh, more subjective and personal narrative, I guess you could say. Mm, yeah. The first one to the right is called uh, Sami Hooks and Daida for Beginners and it's basically, a, it gives you an overview of, of the traditional architectural kind of uh, typologies, the building types that we have, um, and it gives you also some insight into uh, discussions about representation and self-representation, self appropriation obviously becoming an important uh, concept to open up for. Um, and it also takes a look at um, contemporary Sami architecture, so what is built in a sort of on an institutional scale, for example, since the, um, I don't know how much you guys know about the Sami people. I don't know if it's necessary for me. Should I say something about that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, autopilot. <laughs> uh, it's uh, in Norway. We are. Uh, the Norwegian country is um, built on the land of two people. One is the Norwegian people, and the other is the indigenous people, the Sami people. Um, uh, so we are an indigenous people, one of the few ones in Northern Europe, um, or maybe the only one of Northern Europe. Um, and we are uh, uh, living on the traditional Sami land, uh, which is starting, I guess, a little bit south of Trondheim, if you're familiar with Norwegian geography. and going north from there. Uh, it uh, spans over four different nation states. So it's on Norwegian, Swedish, Finnish, and Russian territory. We are, uh, it's hard to number us. Many Samis also don't want to admit that they are Samis. So it's a very fluctuating kind of number that we operate with when we count Samis. 
Uh, but I guess the number I've heard lately is like between 100 and 200,000 people. Um, I think there are many more, <coughs> uh, depending on the definition, of course. Um, yeah, so we have um, been here since uh, time immemorable, uh, meaning indigenous status. Uh, and uh, we are not only one culture. So what you said about uh, me coming from a reindeer herding culture is just partially true. Uh, we have many other different livelihoods as well. But the reindeer herding is what we're most known for, um, since it's a bit, uh, I guess, more exotic and more noticeable as a bit more um, different type of culture than what we normally uh, uh, live with. In, in this sedentary kind of modern civilization. I know I'm going to talk to them about <laughs> it. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, but uh, originally we were, um, uh, or we are, nine different languages. So as you were talking about, uh, not different dialects, but actually nine, ten, ten. Uh, different language groups. There are distinct Sami languages. The one most uh, fam common to know about or to hear when you turn on the Sami news, for example, is the Northern Sami, which is the language group that is has most Sami speakers, uh, and it, which is from the area where I'm from. Um, so that's the language that I'm speaking. I didn't grow up with it as a mother tongue, but uh, I knew a bit, and I'm learning, and I'm now doing. Uh, very rather interesting experiment with my three-year-old daughter and so she only speaks Sami with me so it's, it's still it's working uh, fine until now I don't know about puberty and teenage time how that's gonna those complex conversations gonna work in Sami for me but I hope I hope I can manage uh, or maybe I'll be better by then um, it was that okay or are there any questions about the Sami culture. I could maybe say a little bit about the political sort of um, contemporary uh, climate today. Uh, we are, we have uh, been obviously uh, taken, I moved sort of our traditional land and livelihood, especially uh, traditional fishing in the rivers and traditional sort of sea coastal, small scale coastal fishery uh, and reindeer herding on in the inland of um, of these areas have been uh, very, very pressured by other initiatives, other sort of resource extracting initiatives, mining industry and uh, um, fish farming now and uh, uh, windmill and uh, hydroelectric power plants projects that uh, many of them also the Norwegian state have <coughs> been uh, organizing and building themselves. So, so there's obviously been conflicts about this the last hundred years or so uh, and since the 60s and 70s the conflicts have been quite dramatic and in the, there's a famous case from the from 1979 where and 81 where uh, the Norwegian state wanted to dam up the Mazi riverbed which is where my family is from my father's born there um, and I have my uncle and aunt there and this led to a there was two, three hundred people that was going to be forcefully removed because the Norwegian state wanted to make a hydropower plant on the Alta Masi River and, and they needed to build a big dam, obviously. Uh, so the, the plants changed. They built the dam. The dam is there today. Uh, but the, the, the village was not flooded, so they didn't forcefully remove the Sami population of Masi. Mm. But obviously it had that huge... Uh, um, uh, impact on nature, local reindeer herding, and uh, this was a big conflict that I think the prime minister responsible for the building of that dam uh, not so long ago, ago admitted was a mistake to actually follow through with Groholm <laughs> uh, So these kind of conflicts and these issues about land rights uh, uh, has been sort of an ongoing thing. If you're Sami, you're sort of forced to deal with this. And, and it's a, it's a constant sort of struggle uh, to sort of try to um, raise awareness about these issues. Uh, and I think it all comes down to, to you know, the fact that we, 
we have a Sami parliament. Uh, we have our own small, uh, cute little, uh, what's it called, parliamentarian system. Um, so we elect uh, people to sort of represent us on a in a parliament building that's in Karashok. Uh, and it's beautiful, and they're doing a lot of good work, of course, but uh, when it all comes to all, we cannot decide what to do with our traditional lands. We don't have that last sort of autonomous uh, power and that is uh, of course a very complex <laughs> issue to constantly have to deal with mm. yeah mm, many of my fellow Sami colleagues and artists are working also with these issues uh, I'm also bringing it into my work but uh, I'm my point of, of vantage is always architecture and sort of the dimen spatial dimensions of things and, um, I will show you some stuff that I made. I I was when I was sort of putting together this presentation, I thought that this is kunst or handwerk, that it's craft, uh, and then I thought maybe craft isn't, maybe it's not so sort of, maybe craft isn't, maybe I shouldn't take it so literally. But then I sort of took it a little bit literally, after all, because I have some works that I've been right, very sort of consciously working with the concept of craft and working collaboratively with people that define themselves as craftspeople. <coughs> so I wanted to show you some works from that. <coughs> but first I was going to say something else. Uh, <coughs> and that has to do with uh, the research that I did through this magazine, Fanzine Project, where I was looking at um, the contemporary architecture of the Sami landscape. So I was looking at um, uh, the, our, our in the institutions built for the Sami nation, and uh, there's been many of them popping up since the, I guess, the 60s, and and also, uh, let's say, after we lost that Alta case, I think there was sort of a lot of awareness that sort of came to the the Sami, um, uh, the issue of the Samis, and we were, I don't know, maybe a little bit like a, as a compensation, we were uh, given some, maybe more funding for building our new cultural institutions, and of course, these cultural institutions, they're very important for us, uh, and but they also have, must have a design. So there's uh, most of them has architects involved, and none of these architects are Sami. Um, at maybe previously, there weren't so many Sami architects to pick from, um, but um, nevertheless, I think uh, it's this image is, uh, is, a, is a sort of a collage of images that I put together which shows uh, examples of uh, a specific architectural design met method, you could say, where the architects have been uh, taking a rather sort of uh, familiar uh, architectural typology from traditional architecture, a culturally significant building, which is the lavo, which is the conical tent shape, sim bit similar to the tipi of North America, if you are familiar with that. Um, uh, so, so this is for me. Uh, it's it was I, I d realized that there were so many of the buildings that actually were this using the same sort of design method methodology. They were like this sort of giant lavos uh, made by architects that came from the outside into the Sami culture. They found the lavo. They got very excited by that. Naturally, beautiful, exotic. It's the first and most sort of obvious symbol or image that you see when you meet the sort of traditional Sami architecture and. And then all of these architects ended up doing exactly the same, which was sort of taking that form, the first form that they saw, and, and put that into an, an otherwise, you know, quite conventional type of architecture. Uh, so our landscape in Sa Sapmi, which is the name of our land, and the Sami areas are now filled with this, this uh, architectural typology of giant lava, and I have sort of jokingly called it a syndrome. So there's some kind of a giant syn level syndrome happening amongst these architects that are asked to design for a Sami a, a specific culture. Um, and uh, well, th it's a complex situation to discuss these things. You can be critical to it, but they also serve a purpose. And especially in, um, if, you, uh, if you look at, this building, which is in uh, Russia, which is in uh, on the Kola Peninsula, 
it's uh, there's two Sami cultural buildings in on the Russian side of the border. Uh, so in these areas, obviously, these buildings serve a quite important purpose. You know, they're actually showing as sort of a Sami presence in these landscapes. So, so I think it's a very sort of a, um, it's a it's a relative thing to to talk when you talk about these things. I think you should. Uh, sort of depend. The li it depends on the situation, uh, how sort of um, uh, how they work in the within the landscape. But there's all kind of different um, functions to these buildings. Um, this is a blacksmith. This is the church or a little chapel. This is a rasteplatz. Um, this is a hotel. This is a cinema. Restaurant cultural house. This is a bar. This is a little small sleeping hut. Shopping mall. R railway station. Another cultural house. And here you have the Sami parliament in Karashok. Uh, the same kind of design metholo methodology also in one way you could say is also used on the grocery store in uh, Kautokeino and Karashok. These are the two sort of main Sami uh, villages in Norway, where the Sami language is used in a, in a everyday situations everywhere, and it's like the majority of the population are Sami. Um, so here they have the Sami Rematusen, which is the Norwegian grocery store. Um, <coughs> thinking about and sort of criticizing these sort of archi architectural met methods i i became a little bit tired i think of of being sort of always critical and sort of always talking about these things um you know and i still talk about it I just, somehow this serves as a very good starting point for for a lot of the things that i'm interested in because it deals with architectural representation in such a uh, direct way and it's a very sort of it's almost like slogan like a thing to present but but I wanted to do something more with it. So I, what I did was that I took this, these photos and I went to the places and villages where I, had, uh, um, where I, I first I developed them into knitting patterns, uh, 10 different colors, uh, sort of based on uh, Dalegarn, a traditional Norwegian wool pro producer, which has some, some really amazing sort of color selections that I really like and I grew up with with my grandmother. <laughs> Um, so I designed that, that sort of a colored pattern of 10 different colors for all the sweaters. Mm, and then I traveled to these villages where, I, where the buildings are and I found people that were skilled knitters there everywhere in Norway. Um, uh, and then, I, uh, then we together sort of, or sh the, 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 the knitters knitted. Uh, I didn't learn how to knit that well, but, but I was sort of in close contact with them and we sort of worked Together we, we worked with this um, this series of uh, textile sort of prototype sweaters that we called Sami shelters. I thought it was a bit interesting to sort of use, um, you know, think about the architecture also as um, as clothing in a way, as like the first sort of soft layer that you put on to protect yourself, uh, and then sort of take these big buildings and bring them sort of back into the very sort of intimate clothes more sensitive architectural scale in a way. Uh, yeah, there, these have been touring for, I think, f almost three years now. There's a bit nice, uh, they're in this group show that sort of keeps being asked to be shown all over Canada, and I think it's going to New Zealand. It's um, uh, it's fun to have such a lightweight work. <laughs> That's like, you can fold them and put them in an envelope and send them, because most of my work, as you'll see, from now on, it's uh, not that small, or um, they're quite material heavy, uh, and there many of them also designed as architectural spaces. <coughs> uh, this is the. <coughs> I thought I would uh, just kind of continue continue on this um, this road of my interest for Sami architecture and the the very sort of deliberate attempts that I've had to to create discourse around what Sami architecture is, what is indigenous architecture. That's another question that sort of has expanded uh, or grown from my interest in Sami architecture. I've done a lot in Canada and also in Australia and I'm sort of continuing continuously in sort of dialogue with 
uh, with other continents or places where the discourse around contemporary indigenous identities are sort of alive. Um, yeah, Chicago and uh, also in uh, the US I've been doing work. Um, but this work is, uh, is more of a sort of a, a, a work that sort of started growing in my, behind me in a way. When I was sitting working in my studio, I, for 10 years, I sort of gradually accumulated books and Xerox copied things and uh, things I printed out that I found online. That was like kind of a, kind of a, after I, I didn't, I haven't been sort of publishing those man magazines or fanzines in, in like eight or nine years, but I still sort of kept doing the same. I still kept sort of collecting all this material and still kept sort of having that same kind of interest. I just didn't do any sort of output of it anymore because I got a bit tired of that. All that. It's a lot of work to copy those scenes and sort of keep, because I didn't have any publisher or any sort of anyone to help me. Um, so there's, there wasn't really time, but I accumulated a lot of material and um, <clears throat> in 2018 I was asked to be the artist, uh, festival artist of Festspillene i Nordnorge in Harstad, uh, which is, uh, yeah, it's like a kind of a big festival happening every year and it's the equivalent to the one in Bergen, but it's uh, of course a bit smaller, and, but it's based around the north. Um, and for that project, I sort of uh, just, it was a bit like a similar moment where I just sort of turned, was wondering what I was gonna do and I just turned around in my studio and I just sort of saw this giant bookshelf that I had there and with all these paperwork and all this sort of untouched archival material and uh, also realized that I'm probably the only one in the world that has these things, uh, this sort of a bit eclectic collection of literature because, you know, of course, obviously, I also collect things that I think is, or books or theory that I think is like kind of relevant to this type of discourse, like uh, things dealing with post-capitalism or things dealing with decolonization, obviously, is a definition that I've been sort of touching on quite a lot the last 10 years. <clears throat> so, so what I w decided to do was that I wanted to make a library, a public library uh, that's called the Sami Architectural Library which is basically sort of st uh, it has a starting point in my, um, uh, in my personal archive. Um, and then I thought, uh, I am very interested in this uh, vernacular architecture. It's one of the things that I constantly do is like when I'm home and uh, driving around in the Sami traditional area, I constantly take photos and I interview people and I'm particularly in love with this beautiful little uh, mobile reindeer herding hut. It's called a gumpi in Sami language. Uh, and I have probably like 20, 30 amazing you know, kind of uh, examples of how they're built and how they're, um, you know, um, uh, thought about. There's a lot of uh, kind of uh, knowledge that exists around this. We're actually making a film about it, me, and I'm a filmmaker uh, these days. Um, but we, uh, but yeah, based on that sort of gumpy technology, I wanted to build the library in a structure like that. So it would be like a mobile kind of small scale library, uh, which could move around and be a little bit um, uh, more uh, kind of fit and equipped to visit more remote Sami areas. Um, parallel to that, uh, in Harstad, I also, so we, I built as a performative thing, as a social space, during the festival, we I brought together a lot of people, uh, two two Sami carpenters, uh, one f that's um, working in the Sami National Theater as a sort of production designer, stage designer there, uh, Ulu Thomas Hatta uh, or Ulu Thomas Nilut, and and uh, a technician from the Sami Art Center in Karasho called Chetil Sombi. <coughs> so together we and Ulu Henrik Einio is another Sami architect who's a bit uh, experienced. He works here in Oslo. Uh, he also helped us a little bit with this, the design and the building of this small um, gumpi, kirje gumpi. Uh, and then we also uh, did a one-day seminar where we invited all the Sami architects that exist in the world. Can anyone guess how many it is? <laughs> it's eight. So we we invited all of these eight, we tracked them down and we sort of dragged them out of their 
cave, wherever they were. Uh, and we said, hey, we are going to make a seminar about Sami architecture. You guys have to come. Uh, we are inviting uh, all the prominent people that has designed all this, well, some of them the giant level buildings, and we're going to talk about Sami architecture, and we're going to sort of bring our heads together. You, do you want to come? Five of them, uh, I think all of them wanted to come. Five of them ended up coming, which was amazing, I think. Um, and then we had a whole day seminar where we discussed and presented our thoughts of Sami architecture. And uh, we started the birth, or it was like the first stepping stone towards the establishment of the Sami Architectural Association, SAS, uh, which will, uh, uh, which it didn't, that Sami, Sami, Sami Geladale, uh, uh, Sami Architectura Servi, it means Sami Architectural Association. Um, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, here is uh, Stein Halvorsen himself, the guy that designed the uh, Sami Parliament, and it was so amazing to meet him. He's this amazing guy, and of course, you know, all the attempts that I had, or all the plans I had to be like critical towards him, just totally didn't work because he was such a he is a brilliant architect and really nice guy. Uh, and then in the back of that space, we had because I thought. Uh, okay, we're gonna make this giri gumpi, and I think what what's really interesting is you know since we have so little sort of cultural history around architecture in a way, contemporary architecture in Sami context is like kind of it's a bit hard. It's not so much. So I thought it would be nice to sort of try to when since we are obviously developing ideas about what is contemporary Sami architecture, I thought it would be nice to sort of to to root it to something that already exists, something that we have that's very that we have strong tradition about, and that is our craft. That's what we call dwedji. The Sami uh, dwedji is not like the Norwegian term hontverk, and it's not like the English word craft. It's something much wider and something much more rooted in depth and a more holistic way, uh, thinking about um, uh, the relationship between man and material. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, so I thought it would be nice to work with what we call uh, Deep mudochi, which is a soft uh, dochi or textile, skin, leather um, crafts. Uh, so I invited um, um, a friend of mine and one of the really, really experts and best uh, doyars, the experts in dochi, uh, to come and to sort of work with me in the back of the or in the space in this week while we were building the structure outside. Um, yeah, so here is Katarina Spikskum, that's her name. Here is her, this is the, uh, she's really, really good and she's really also a perfectionist. Many of these people working with these, you know, hand-stitched leather projects, they are very, very concerned about detail and uh, perfection. Um, but I really wanted to challenge her and to sort of think more about um, improvisation and sort of fast, efficient way of working with uh, materials. Uh, here is uh, her sleeping bag. Um, I don't know if I have. Yeah, I think I don't have so many. We did a lot of different things. I don't have so many photos of that here, but I will skip through and show you uh, other photos later. Some really do low resolution these photos. Um, yeah, we finished the project, uh, or it never really finished, I guess, but it sort of. The festival finished, and we had to move uh, the structure to another place. So we moved it to Jukmok, um, which is another Swedish town. It's on the on the um, Swedish side of the border, and it's an amazing winter market there that happens every year for I think a couple of hundred years, and it's one of the biggest events in northern Sweden. If you want to experience real Sami craft, go there. It's fantastic. It happens in February every year, so it's like in the really sort of cold, wintry week. Um, where you know it could be minus twenty thirty, which is in itself for people that are not used to winter cold, it's a really it's a really cool uh, experience. You feel it on your skin. Um, yeah, so we brought the library there and we installed it uh, in the in the garden of a museum, and we had uh, some events happening, and we were sort of talking to people and serving food and. Uh, playing around with the local material that we found there and to build some sort of kind of shelving units. Uh, this is another sort of experiment that also took place within this platform. I have been working with this now for three, four, five years. Um, so there's a lot of this sort of 
small sculptural, I guess, sort of experimental conceptual design works that are put into it. This is a project that I did for an exhibition in Oslo at UKS, actually, some years ago, where I, uh, based on drawings of this colonial uh, monument uh, from Greenland, this is a building uh, called Block P, which was built as part of the Danish G60, G50 politics, where the Danish uh, government wanted to forcefully, or they wanted to, it was a centralizing politic, a politics of centralization, urbanization, that the uh, Danish government were uh, putting on the whole Greenlandic uh, country. So they forcefully removed people from the villages into cities, and in the middle of Nuuk Centrum, they built this <laughs> uh, giant um, social housing project and much inspired by, I guess, uh, Khrushchevska architecture and Russian uh, Soviet communist architecture from the 30s. Um, how to ho host uh, as many people as possible in one building, uh, I guess, was the strategy. And they... Uh, uh, yes, these are, this is in Nuuk in Greenland. So these are Inuits that were moved from, you know, people living on the land in small housing units, probably used to fishing and having very much of a, a life in close relation to nature elements, uh, harvesting from them. They were in uh, three days uh, moved from these places into this building in the middle of Nuuk. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting story about it. And I'm working with a contemporary geographer called Tune Huse. She will be in Bergen for that talk that you are coming to. Uh, and we are, uh, so she's writing about it, and she's like, yeah, and that's on the 31st of October. So I'm working, and I will also, there's also another work here, which also is, I like to work with scientists and researchers and academic people that are very intelligent. I like to, um, <laughs> I, and well, what I like to do is to, to, instead of referencing them, I like to drag them into the project and sort of put them almost in the gallery if it's possible. So that's a little bit what I did with this project. I asked Tuna to write a text. So there is a text that's written about this block uh, in the gallery. And then I also took the facade drawing and I and I uh, contacted uh, uh, a, in, an indigenous group in, in uh, Colombia uh, that are, it's, they are producing this sort of uh, hammock designs through a, uh, an ethic uh, design group in Holland called Maka, Maka Design. So through them, um, we, I got them to design and to weave this, this hammock based on this uh, indigenous architectural colonial design. Uh, so that's a part of the library and it's also in Bergen. You can like lay down and read the text from Tune if you want. Um, then, <coughs> then the library was invited to go to Canada, which was a really amazing opportunity. It's in the National Gallery of Canada. There was a big exhibition opening last year called Abadakwene, which is an indigenous, international indigenous um, quintennial. So not biennial, but something happening every five years, a bit like Documenta. Uh, they have made one edition, which was called Sakahan, uh, 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 which is it's the it's a from it's a word and the title is hand is is uh is uh f from the local indigenous language anishinaabe language mm. and uh for the second edition of the of this uh, indigenous uh quintennial they invited me to do to be one of five artists doing commissioned work and they wanted the library and then instead of bringing that uh, structure, which felt really weird to sort of bring it over the seas like that, uh, we just decided to build a new one and rather work with the sort of the, um, the books themselves. So the books were there. Uh, and then, but then I also um, wanted to sort of continue this sort of this architectural experiment with the connection between skin and leather production and architectural design. Uh, so what I did was to invite Katerina. She came over, and I also met with this fantastic craftswoman from. She was Anishinaabe from that territory, from the area. She's called um, uh, Grace Rat Jerome. Uh, so together with Katerina and Grace, we did this like week-long workshop where we, where we were working with skin, and we were teaching each other how to, you know, prepare skin in the traditional Anishinaabe way and the traditional Sami way, and and also in 
some ways that where we sort of invent it <laughs> a little bit. Uh, we had three moose skins that we installed on the outside. So this is the this is the foyer of the of the of the National Gallery, and I was I built that structure in between those four concrete com columns. I wanted to sort of elevate. I don't have so good photos of it, but uh, I wanted to elevate the the library a little bit and make it a little bit like a, something in between a storage house and a library. And it's a bit inspired by my aunt's storage house in Marsey, which has this like uh, really really amazing aesthetical expression. And she knows it, and she always like shows when she, I come visit her. She has, has to show me some new stuff that she's put into her shed, and she pretends like she she didn't prepare it or that she didn't doesn't know that it looks great, but. It does, really does. Uh, and then we, yeah, we kept sewing things. This is like actually, um, it's a bag that I found. I, I got like access to the, uh, to the sort of storage rooms in the gallery. So I just picked old banners and old things that were sort of, they didn't, hadn't thrown out yet. Um, and some of them, these are like bags for paintings. These like nylon covers that were sewn for some, some Renaissance paintings. And I stole or I got two of those and then we sort of made some sleeping bags out of them. Um, and then we made book covers for s many of the books, which are some of them are, I really like these, they're uh, me and Katarina sort of working together. She's sewing and sort of, I'm just running around finding different things, proposing her to sew from. And sometimes she says no, uh, <laughs> but actually sometimes she, she, she does it. So, so for example, this one, this uh, this is a s made from a seal skin that I brought, uh, and then this little dusk pompon pompon maybe mm -hmm. castle castle, castle. <laughs> this little tassel here uh, was actually from a from an exhibition that just closed before we came that was from uh, about Marie Antoinette mm -hmm. so they had made this like tassel design in the whole gallery so we added that to the seal skin and it became really I think it really liked it quite a lot. And then these some these are some kind of um, this yeah these are all kind of pork uh, huge African porcupine needle that we sewn into this that we found in the in the museum shop uh, so we were like sort of scavenging the area for different things to put together um, and then on the outside we made this uh, sort of social gathering space where we of course dealing with skin tanning skin. Uh, also skinning animals is like a really bloody and dirty, gory kind of thing uh, process. So so we wanted to do it outside and we found this like really beautiful little area that was designed there to sort of do theater, I think. They do it like every year summer theater, but the rest of the year this park or this like public space is standing quite unused. So after a lot of work, we were allowed to actually do this and to make a fire and to get water and to sort of build the space in the way that I wanted to build it, which was like, me and um, my colleague and assistant driving around for a week, uh, scavenging things on uh, Finn or Kuiwiji, which is a Canadian sort of secondhand online, a place where you can get stuff cheap, uh, and also in uh, the dump and b and just finding. Of course, in the it's turned out that actually this gallery is so big and they have such a big uh, staff and amount of material that a lot of the material we actually found just be going down to the dungeons of that building. Um, yeah, and then to make a little sort of rain cover, I found this old uh, Gauga poster. Uh, I don't know if you know the story about Gauga, who he is and what he was doing. Yeah, maybe you know. Uh, but I thought it was a fun thing to sort of use that cover, uh, use that poster banner as a, as a roof for a little building and to cut out his nose felt also a little bit appropriate. Uh, we were also doing, while we were dri driving to get, get the material, we, we discovered a lot of roadkills. There's really a lot of roadkills in this area. Ottawa, this is in Ottawa. It's like it's, a very, it's an area that's quite rural, actually. Um, so a lot of the highways had roadkills, which we picked and skinned and worked with on that uh, place. As I said, we had three moose skins, so it became this like kind of social uh, energy around that uh, space where... Um, where people were contributing or just popping by and wanting to try, because uh, Grace and uh, Katarina were there, the teaching uh, all the time. Uh, we boiled, we did it the Sami way, which is uh, to boil the, we take the bark from the willow, uh, the selje, 
and we bo- we boil it for hours and to get this really really uh, basic kind of uh, almost like a tea, a very dense type of tea, and then we soak the skins in that and we tan it in that way. There's a bit of a different way to do it in the um, Anishinaabe area. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's a video that I want to show from this, which uh, shows a little bit the atmosphere because we uh, there were s- some people. Canada is really great in sort of. Um, uh, educating their institutions and to sort of taking this concept of decolonization a little bit serious. So they have actually hired and established a department of indigenous art at the National Gallery. So there's three curators there. There are indigenous um, and they work with indigenous issues and they are constantly sort of pushing the limits and borders of what this uh, meeting point between a sort of Canadian <coughs> official institution and an indigenous cultural concept can be. Uh, this project is obviously one of them. Um, uh, but m- since we had that connection, we were also a bit connected to some communities. So when we invited uh, people to come, and amongst them like a group of um, traditional singers, which I, this video is, uh, the sound, sound is from their performance. just to show the atmosphere. It's 12.30 now. Um, well, are you finished or would you like to talk a little bit longer? I could Do talk a bit longer. Do you want to talk for like 10 minutes more? Please, yeah, please. Okay. Um, <coughs> yeah, but that's good because then I get to uh, show a little bit of stuff from Bergen also, yeah. which is a, yeah, it's a, it's a very big exhibition for me uh, that I've been working on now for... T- two years, one and a half year, uh, and it opened now in in uh, the 4th of September. Um, and um, it was supposed to open in May, like it usually does, that exhibition happening every year. Uh, it was a big honor, obviously, to be asked to do something like that. Uh, uh, and also a big opportunity, because there is a little bit of you know funding already there, for example, because it has a tradition and it has a bit of a, a structure uh, built around it. Um, yeah, so for that project, I did, uh, I brought also the library there. Uh, I did five, six different projects, but um, I also did this one new project, which is also sort of a collaboration with Katarina Speak School that you just saw uh, in Canada. Uh, I brought her into this project as well. Um, and that is this project, uh, which I called Rakas. Uh, Rakas is uh, Sami word for a small inner tent uh, which is used in uh, in uh, it's used inside the lavos to create some side sort of privacy you see one hanging here 
Uh, we made one for the Giri Gumpi uh, when we were working in Hashta. And, and this rachas is um, it's a tradition that's uh, not so common anymore. It's um, people are not doing it, but it's uh, there's still some people doing it. And I remember seeing it the first time when I was a kid and sleeping in that. And it was just amazing. Of course, you had this like little magic a tent inside the lavu. Um, uh, and it's made for privacy, but it's also made to keep the mosquitoes out for children. And also to some uh, some people also say it has an effect towards smoke because it can be a bit smoky when the weather is wet in a lavo. Mm, but I wanted to sort of make those and then, um, well, that wasn't really where the project started, but I, I found through Matthias Dumboldt, who I just told you about, who's an art historian in Copenhagen, he's Norwegian, but he's been working a lot with co the history of colonization of the Nordic countries, uh, which is something that we in Norway uh, like to think about as something that never really happened, that we never colonized anyone. But that is simply not true. Uh, there are some stories about that, and there's also stories, if you think about Norway as a part of the Danish state, which it was for two, three, four hundred years. Um, the Danish state also has it, it, its stories about, for example, colonizing Greenland. Uh, and also the Norwegian Danish government when they were one kingdom, they also sent a lot of uh, missionaries and, let's be honest, colonizers uh, from the south up to the northern Sami areas to to missionate, to mis to missionate, <laughs> to teach the the word of God to um, to Sami people, which were not Christian. So we had our own natural Sami traditional religion, um, and. But during the 17th century, especially, and early 18th century, a lot of missionaries were sent up there too. They were building churches and they were Christianizing the, the Sami people as a, as a strategy of occupying land territories, obviously. The church was used as a colonizing force, as I think in some ways it still is um, on other continents. <coughs> uh, but yeah, so... Uh, one of the guys that went on these missionary trips is a guy called Knut Lem. He was Danish. He was Norwegian Danish uh, priest and uh, also linguist. And he went to. Uh, he lived in Alta for ten years in the early 17th century, and he uh, also became a prominent, I guess, um, uh, uh, yeah, person. And he r in published a book based on these travels and journeys in the north in 1769, um, which is this book, which is commonly known. You see it here to the left. Uh, and it contains 100 uh, copper etchings of Sami life, li the life amongst the Samis. Uh, Knut Lem, to, uh, double E, L-E-E-M, Knut. And this book is amazing. It's fantastic. And every Sami that is a bit nerdy about history knows this book. And uh, and the, the the drawings, the etchings are beautiful, and they are made by um, a a copper etcher that was he's, he was hired by the Danish king in Copenhagen to do these kind of etchings, and he was super skilled and and uh, and these etchings are they are um, reproduced a lot of places and and uh, and the the f first sort of the first sort of detailed description about Sami architecture is in this book. There's, and it's, uh, he was really geeky about architecture, this Knut Lem guy. So he's actually going in and sort of dissecting a building and looking how it's constructed, what kind of material. He's describing the sort of social uh, organization that's, or the, the way, the plan basically of the Lavu, like how were people living, who were sitting where in the Lavu. And he's giving a lot of cultural insight that has become very important for the, for the Sami culture, I guess. Uh, for us, we use it as well. Uh, so, um, talking to Matthias, it turned out that he had discovered that there was another book that was actually made as a prototype for this book that no one had ever republished any material from. So what I did was that I jumped on a plane, I went straight to Copenhagen, and me and Matthias went into this dungeon of the Danish Royal Library. We were put on these like white gloves and followed like by some kind of security guards, taking to um, uh, a place where we were allowed to view this specimen, uh, and that's this book that you see me holding to the right. And these uh, drawings are made previous to that, and they're made by an unknown painter. We don't know who made them. Uh, Matthias has done some research, and he found out that there might be this guy called Johannes Rush, and he's probably right, but it's not like 
It's not 100% percent like, sure yet. Um, but what's so amazing about these ones are that they are much more lively made. They are not sort of put through that sort of uh, copper etching uh, style that this royal copper etcher dude, I don't remember his name, uh, made them through. So, so these are so pedagogical and they're so naively uh, made and beautiful in their expression, I think. So I was completely in love with them. And I w- what I wanted to do was, you know, thinking about these symbols that we are sort of uh, exposed to and where they come from. I wanted to sort of take these images and sort of, instead of, you know, reproducing them, I wanted to sort of own them. I wanted to make them Sami. I wanted them to be ours in a way, I'd like to jump all these sort of layers of uh, academic um, sort of reproduction. So I made big uh, three by two meter <coughs> uh, prints on this kind of different type of cotton canvas and silk canvas. Uh, and then to get, Katarina was supposed to sew this in the gallery and it was supposed to be this amazing performative social room around it. But due to the, um, the corona <coughs> situation, she wasn't actually allowed to come. Uh, or we didn't, she didn't make it. So we were sort of communicating back and forth online and sending things back and forth. Um, so she sold this rakas based on these um, these uh, fabrics, and we started to also patch them a little bit and cut in them. And she also used her. It's quite touching, actually, but she's using uh, some of her mother's old beddings, and her ma- mother had actually passed away. She was also a famous seamstress from that area. Uh, she passed away just like weeks before this, so it was very. They're they're quite uh, quite nice, I think. And this is how they're installed in the gallery. So if you're familiar with the Bergen Kunsthalle, it's the space number, w- the gallery one, which is the big gallery. I sort of, I made this sort of uh, kind of a bit inspired by traditional seating, which is called the Loidi. I've done that quite a few times. It's a very nice way to sort of, um, I guess, to occupy and to sort of uh, reconfigure the energy of galleries is to sort of work with these more organic sort of architectural typologies or elements. The, the the softness of the floor and the smell of the space completely changes the energy in there. Uh, so then I installed these two. They're called loidos. They're like the side flooring of a lavo. So I built those, or they were actually they started to look a little bit like some kind of Star Wars ship because of the shape. But uh, so they're not traditional loidos. They're a bit like my bit uh, in, into personal interpretation. So and then we hung these four. We made four of these rakas. And we hung them in the space so the audience can actually go inside and touch them and also lay on inside of them. Some kids were doing that, and I like that. That's that's the way to view them or to sort of a bit uh, to interact with them in a way or encourage people to interact with them. And then there's another work that's hanging there, <coughs> which is um, I'm not going to speak so much about that. It's also a kind of a long story, but it's also sort of it's a, it has a bit of a parallel to this work because it's. It's a work that uh, also relates to some old historical ethnographic sources that I found, which is actually a word uh, that I found in a in a in a dictionary made by a guy called Just Kvigsta, who, hundred years later, than Knut Lem was traveling the coastal area, uh, Sami uh, areas of Sami Sami lands up me where where I'm living, in Tromsø, the area around Tromsø. So, and there's a word in one of the dictionary which is called Skjevar. And that word uh, translates to a halibut stomach dried and spanned over a wooden frame used as window. That's the exact word phrasing of it. So being an architectural typology, I found this very cur- very interesting and I started to investigate this tradition and no one could, I didn't find any visual example, any other sources that talk about this Skeva tradition. But um, yeah, so I thought it was kind of a, cool thing to do to try and explore this materiality. So, yeah, together with a few craftsmen, uh, one of them being, uh, yeah, I didn't take a photo of her, yeah. uh, Anastina Svako, her name is. She's also a dwoyer and a craftsperson. We started to explore the sort of the um, qualities of this these stomachs, the halibut stomachs, and I worked with a local Sami fisherman, and then I made this little, that was a bit funny, in the summer of 2000, last summer, I was, uh, yeah, 
I was I made this little uh, sort of a under uh, yeah behind some factories in Tromsø. I made this little halibut stomach cleaning factory, and I made like fi- fifty of them. And then I traveled to actually to Chicago. This was shown last year in, sh- in the Chicago Architectural Biennale. So I brought over these stomach skins, and then I sold this four and a half meter big screen, which has a sound uh, installation that's made by Alexander Isaug and an animation made by Marcus Garvin. They're all both artists based in Tromsø. Um, and uh, so it's a bit of a, so I wanted to have some kind of a bit like a outer space-ish kind of energy to contrast this very sort of organic and ancient type of uh, materiality. And it's all sewn together by by this type of thread, which I was taught to make, which I was made from rain, reindeer sinew. So it's the, the, yeah, the sinew of a reindeer. Mm, yeah, I'll that stop there. Berlin, this is from Chicago, but then I, d- yeah. This is in Bergen, so okay. it's, yeah, it, you see it there. You see it? You see it hanging there, but it, I didn't build that structure. I sort of just took the screen. And here you see detail of it. This is in Bergen, the detail there is from Bergen. Um, yeah, so that's a very like a material based experiment that I really, I think uh, I really like that. I think I'm, uh, yeah, I'm working on, on new ideas, but that's another thing. Thank you.